Hello, this is meeting 15 of the Visual Tools group. And here we are, Lucas and Theodore and Mark and Daniel. And we'll be discussing a few components of, of the emerging ecosystem for note-taking, literate programming, and knowledge management and such in Croatia. And what we'll have today is a tiny demo by Lucas of the Calva notebooks, which is just a promo for a dedicated meeting really soon, hopefully. And then a presentation by Theodore about Theodore's practice of a certain knowledge, man knowledge management system in Clojure and Babashka and such. And then uh, I, Daniel, I will present this kindly project, which is a common ground, uh, you know, a proposal for a common ground to take notes in different tools. And then we'll have a discussion. And this visual tools group, it is a group for tool makers and tool users in Clojure to collaborate and discuss things like that. And um, yeah, so uh, I guess we, we could begin. Uh, by introducing ourselves. So maybe, uh, Mark, would, would you like to tell a bit about yourself, even though you're so famous, of course? Okay, I'll give a shot. Uh, hi, Mark Champagne. Um, I've been a closurist for over a decade, uh, been involved in lots of different ways, attended many closure conges. Uh, I'm uh, still the lead organizer for the Boston Closure Group, although we haven't had a meeting in a while. Uh, things went off the rails with COVID, but um, uh, still trying to keep my hand in, participate in conferences, and uh, I'm very interested in seeing the visual tools ecosystem uh, advance, uh, you know, become more sophisticated, easier to use. Uh, personally, I'd like to uh, be able to do rapid prototyping of, of uh, graphing and charting, you know, for... Uh, mostly for side projects as, as sort of a, um, a, a way of doing exploratory data analysis that would eventually, uh, you know, become uh, hard coded into, uh, you know, some sophisticated uh, ways of displaying and analyzing, uh, well, in my case, financial data. So that's, but that's, um, that's basically it in a nutshell. So glad to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, Theodore? Yeah, uh, so my name is Theodore. Uh, I used to be a civil engineer. Uh, then I started working more and more with software. And now I'm doing more uh, product, product discovery uh, than before. Uh, and I've realized that I really care about knowledge and how we, how we model knowledge. So that's uh, what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, yeah, uh, Lucas. Hi, I'm Lucas. Um, I got involved in the visual tools of, uh, by attending, uh, what was it called, Reclosure last year, and I uh, got in touch with Daniel. Um, and I, I'm the main maintainer of OmniTrace, a tracing library for like your codes and stuff, and one of the maintainers of uh, Calva. And uh, today we're apparently going to talk about Calva notebooks, which are a new thing, and, um, which uh, I built into Calva in a weekend, and which is pretty nice to be able to have rich notebooks like uh, the like the Jupyter uh, notebooks and similar, um, just from your normal Calva file, uh, closure file. Calva needs its own files apparently now. Um, and one of the coolest things is that it's working pretty similar to like a clerk notebook that a lot of people have probably seen, um, but you don't need like any special running environment. It's just like in your editor, like everything else. Wonderful. Uh, I'm Daniel. I am a statistics person. I do statistics and I'm involved in a few of the study group and dev groups like this one in the Closure community. And uh, yeah, and today I'll, I'll show something I've been doing, which is these 
tiny little projects called Kindly and Clay, which are about literary programming. And yeah, so I guess now, Lucas, if it makes sense, we could have like a short promo about yeah, sure. notebooks. Uh, yeah, I don't have anything like any to the, the, anything running right now. Uh, I just started this notebook up, but I found a short video uh, by Chris that already contains like the interesting little bits. So I can talk over that uh, and we'll show like the, the actual big demo next time together with Chris, which I think makes sense because like at least half of this is his work. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll try sharing my screen. Let's see if I manage. I've got too many screens these days. Uh, let's see, I think it's this one. Yeah, that looks correct. Okay, cool. Uh, so this is uh, a video that's posted in the portal channel uh, in Slack, uh, if you wanna like look at it yourself. Um, and it's like a short demo of portal and Calva notebooks interacting. Um, and you can see, uh, what's even needed to just start uh, the Calva notebooks. You just need a REPL connection. Um, I'm hopeful that was not what I wanted. Um, you just need a REPL connection like you would normally have. And then all you do is right click a file, go to open with, select closure notebooks instead of the file. And then you get this a uh, nice little notebook and an overlay. Uh, <laughs> a nice little notebook where every top level form in that file is basically a cell that you can run. Um, if you have a uh, portal installed as well, uh, the portal extension in VS Code, um, each of those outputs get a little bit richer. We can see uh, Chris running it now. And you get basically a rich outputs in between all of those calls. Um, and each of those cells is basically a running portal uh, version and works like portal normally would. You get like rich contents and can click around in that, get traces and whatever. Um, we'll show a bit more of like the innards of that in the, uh, talk next time probably. Um, yeah, but the interesting bit around it is that you don't need any special setup. You don't need any special files or anything. You just use your normal closure files and those need, don't need to be special files. One of the things that was always annoying to me about something like Clerk is that you need code in between your defense or whatever that's actually executed which is like, usually we don't write our code like that, right? Um, we write our code by just having, um, just having rich comments at the end, but like only usually having defense in between because you don't want stuff executing when the namespace is loading, right? Um, and one of the cool things that um, about these notebooks as well is that uh, these uh, four statements are actually like in the file are just like inside a rich comment block at the bottom. And these still get split up into their own cells and can be run. So like these could all be just defense which don't really like actually have any interesting output um, and only the bottom whatever's would have actual output. So you could like run your normal closure namespaces that you have for work without having to like put any special stuff into that file, um, which is really nice. Um, yeah, anyway, I think that's a nice trailer for next time or something. Um, I'm happy to like talk about it more uh, if you want. I don't know if there's any questions. Hello, Kira, by the way, thank you for joining. Uh, we were just, uh, you know, just beginning and having um, a really tiny demonstration of Calvano books by Lucas, a promo for next time. And um, yeah, and now, Theodor, you had a comment a few minutes ago and I stopped you about, about uh, or comment on a question about Calvano books. Should we come back to that? Or is it too late already? 
Uh, I, I think I remember what I said, but Lucas basically answered it during oh. the presentation. So uh, I, I'm happy to just uh, leave discussion for later. Should we move on to myself? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll share my screen then. It's kind of interesting that Kira joined because she got an informal attempt at explaining what it is I'm making, which I felt was really badly worded <laughs> last time. <laughs> so I'm getting a second chance now. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, so I'll just uh, show you the thing first. So this is a website, a normal website. It's just HTML. Uh, but I've spent quite a bit of time on content for it. Uh, and I kind of landed on a structure uh, that I feel like is working. Uh, and I it really helps me think when I want to do something and just share it in public. So get feedback on drafts and, and write write out things. Uh, and there's this <laughs> go to random uh, page button, <laughs> which I, I kind of enjoy just just having to, to go around. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to uh, remove the emphasis on that and talk through some points. Uh, so the reason why I'm sharing it here is that I'm interested in Cycloach and collective knowledge management. And I think we have a job to do uh, when it comes to collective knowledge management. Uh, and I'm quite excited about my current learning process. Uh, when I want to learn something right now, I just make a page for it uh, on my site and then I work. And I find that helps me think. So I'm going to share a bit today. Uh, and I have this idea in my head, uh, where we have sort of a cyclosure knowledge archi archipelago, uh, where there are kind of islands of knowledge that are loosely connected and people can contribute. Uh, and I think we kind of, we need, I mean, we, we, we don't have a central, uh, resource, uh, authority. So yeah. So if we can make it easy to create knowledge, uh, collect and curate knowledge and easy to learn, I think uh, we can have a bigger impact. Uh, so a bit about my note-taking process. Uh, I've been journaling for a long time. Uh, I counted uh, some journaling lines and uh, I found out that I started out in 2017. Uh, I had 2,000 lines of journaling uh, that year. Then it increased a bit, and then it's kind of become less. Uh, but it doesn't just become less because I'm writing less. I'm I'm kind of writing more, but I'm writing in different places. Uh, so in 2020 was when I found uh, Rome Research, which I use extensively. Um, because then I can actually find my stuff later. Uh, but then this year, I kind of got frustrated that I wasn't able to share easily uh, what I made. Uh, so I've tried to use the web for what it is, uh, not products that pull you away from the web, but just use the internet. Yeah, so uh, I guess I already said who I am. But I used to do civil engineering. Uh, writing reports is a part of that, uh, which means I kind of have. I know I'm noticing that I have different expectations to documentation uh, than from what I see uh, in my team. Uh, than a bit of software, and these days a lot of product discovery, uh, figuring out what is the right thing to build, and I'm really dissatisfied with tools like Notion because they pull me away from plain text. Uh, I'd rather use plain text and Git and get some rich linking. So I'm I'm very interested in how we can build knowledge together. And lately I've been inspired a lot uh, by a book called uh, The Beginning of Infinity uh, by David Deutsch. Uh, <laughs> and I guess we can just press enter on this thing. So this is my 
Uh, this is my notes on that book. And that's the Wikipedia page. So what you're seeing right now is just uh, a page in my system. Uh, but I'm going to go back and just continue from where I was. Yeah. Uh, so uh, on the right here, you kind of you have the sites, and uh, here is the rendered version of the notes. Uh, but I figured we could kind of try to do something a bit more interactive right now. Uh, this is Emacs, and this is the current folder. Index.org is the file that you're seeing, which is text file that contains this. Uh, this is just HTML. So if I search for story, I find that h2, which is the same as you're seeing there. Uh, and if I go out, I found, find a play.eden file, which is uh, metadata. So that's the title. <laughs> uh, this is my default readiness uh, for incomplete contact, uh, content, uh, which is what happens uh, when I create new stuff. And then it just comes into this pile of links. Yeah, so I asked you, uh, Daniel, to kind of help me a bit uh, with the navigation. So does this make sense? I could show how to create a page and apply it. We could create a page for you. That would be wonderful. OK, so we're going to start there. Uh, I have a create page function. Uh, this is a small Emacs list wrapper for a Babashka CLI. Uh, when I want to create a page, I just press enter. I get asked for a page ID. I see that should have been page slug. Uh, see if I can spell your name correctly. I don't even know how to pronounce it <laughs> and spell it. <laughs> okay. So now we got dropped into a new folder. Uh, and there's an index.org page. Uh, I guess we could uh, look you up on Twitter to find the link. Uh, yeah, okay. Now I, by habit, I pressed space uh, uh, M. Uh, and that's the make thing. That runs make on top level. And I'm going to look at the git status. So we see that the top level make file changed. There's now a Daniel Stutsky index page. Uh, the top level index uh, changed. There was a new link. Uh, and there were some changes to uh, another index, a Eden index and a JSON index. And there's a new folder. Daniel, and there's a new file uh, in index slash by UUID, UUID. Yeah. So I'm just going to uh, add all of those and write a really bad commit message and push. Uh, so now, if we just go on GitHub uh, and I find the thing, uh, then we see here that Cloudflare is working. Um, and this is kind of, uh, this annoys me. Uh, I, I don't have a build, uh, because I just check everything in. So my git push takes a second, and then I have to wait half a minute for Cloudflare to do its thing. Um, but we can just leave that running. Um, and if I go back now, uh, into here. Now I can insert a link and I can insert a link to Daniel and I can navigate to that link. Uh, and in a sense, now I'm kind of, I'm cheating uh, because I'm leaning on something called OrgRoam, uh, which is a knowledge management system <clears throat> in org mode. But I've kind of, I, I've been making an effort to abstract myself uh, as far as possible away from that. And I also see that, yeah, we're deployed. So if I now go on 
Wait. Try to find Daniel. And there's Daniel. Yeah. And we can link to all the pages. That's what I did just there. Uh, and there's a play.clj relations CLI. Uh, so we could have a look at that. Um, and I just have to move uh, some Zoom menu away. Um, yeah. We could start that. So this is a local preview. And now I'm just getting a terminal in here. And I'm pasting that command. And then that opens uh, the same thing on localhost. Uh, so I could navigate to this page. Um, And we can go down to the demo. And I thought I had uh, live updates. Yeah, OK, it's working. So I, I think I'm just going to open uh, for for questions right now. I could show you the kind of relations CLI because I have some kind of kind of interesting metadata access. But uh, what do you think, Daniel? Why not? Actually, we have a lot of time. Okay. Are there any other questions to the things that I just showed? Um. What's like the advantage of your system compared to something like, I don't know, Logsec or whatever? I have a uh, direct uh, control over the HTML, so I can do anything uh, I can do in HTML. Um, but wouldn't you have like the same thing if you just like use something like, I don't know how Rome works, but like I've been using Logsec for like a little bit now and they're just building markdown files underneath, right? So you could just take those markdown files and generate the HTML you want out of them and like have all the other tooling for free, basically, uh, like your org Rome extension, basically just like with all the other stuff and the markdown can create whichever HTML you want, right? So uh, the, the first part of my answer would be, I don't know, I'm using Rome. I haven't really put that much effort into Luxic, and Rome has really poor support for plain text because you're just sitting in in that outlining thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the other part, I guess this is this is all text based, so there's no need to use any third party products at all. Uh, I, I think that's that says something about the reach because it doesn't depend on having installed things and having an account and, and doing things the, the log seek way. But uh, mm. I, I'd actually be interested in seeing uh, people explore building their knowledge base on log seek and, mm. and pushing the flexibility of what, what they can do then. Yeah, I mean, I haven't used log seek a lot yet. Um, but at work, we are doing uh, like markdown based similar stuff just for regulatory texts. And we actually like then build an LSP on top of like that markdown and whatever. And our tool to do extra stuff is VS Code, right? Um, and then you can say, similar to your thing, you can ask questions about a text, like what are the incoming links and whatever. Like I'm guessing you have basically the same tooling for your thing. And um, I'm just wondering if there's like any advantages to having it in this system compared to something like a markdown based system or whatever. Mm. Just a second. There's someone at the door. Yeah, no problem. Uh, from the Pacific Ocean style and by the <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, 
my honest answer is I, I don't know because I don't have an overview over all the options. Uh, I know that I've I'm really liking my workflow right now. Uh, if there are other similarly good workflows, uh, I want us to just put them all next to each other and and see see what the differences are, make yeah, a sure meeting out of it. Yeah. Uh, maybe I could mention one reason why I'm interested in this, and that is being small, being something that is not the huge system as Logsic. So possibly this could be used as a rendering engine for other contexts like literate programming, right? Like rendering our namespaces. And that is why I'm really, really interested in possibly mm. integrating with it. Yeah, so that's that's a really good point uh, because I, uh, let's have a look at that make file. Uh, yeah, so it's huge. Uh, let's find Daniel's page. And I'm just going to copy this into <laughs> another buffer uh, so that we can split uh, the lines a bit. Uh, so there's a pandoc command that reads uh, from org mode and takes an input file and uh, pipes that into a filter resolve links and pipes that out into pandoc. So I don't really have any dependencies on uh, input formats uh, other than that they have to be convertible to by pandoc. So if we have a look at pandoc, uh, this small figure shows the supported input files. So there's T2T and Textile and TikiWiki and TSV. Yeah. Right now, I'm just preferring org mode, uh, but yeah. So there aren't that many dependencies. Did that kind of answer your comments, Daniel? Yes. Yeah. And now, if it is OK, could we talk more about the closure part, about yep. the input and output of it and, and what it does? So uh, this is just like a big folder. There's uh, subfolders for each of the articles. Uh, <laughs> lots of folders. Um, uh, but if there's one interesting file, it's this file. So this is the CLI. Uh, so the whole thing is a Babashka CLI. And I was able to write the whole thing just in order to write content. So it's not like a lot of code. It's actually 500 lines now. Uh, but if we look at the commands, uh, let's rather go to the bottom uh, and see that dispatch table. So there's a command for creating pages. There's a command for running filters. Uh, a filter is, right now there's only a filter to make sure the links resolve because I use UIDs in the input. And there's a command to create the index by UID. There's a command to create the make file. There's a command to go to a random page. And there's a command uh, to handle metadata. Um, I was about to show that metadata command, so I can just do that now. So if I do play.clj, then I just see the available commands. Uh, and if I do a relation, it's kind of hard to type this inside of Emacs, but I don't want more stuff. Uh, then I see that I can do a from source to target, and sources can be from files or uh, from lines. So I'm going to do from files to lines, I think. Uh, Uh, no, that's wrong. That doesn't work. Um, there needs to be from files to lines. From files reads from the file system. So that's a lot. Uh, so let's just look at the first uh, line. And now... Zoom is in the way again. 
So this thing has a slug, Draco Willink, title Draco Willink, a readiness, and a UUID. Uh, so I could do this from files to lines. I could put this into a uh, lines.idian. Then I could just edit that lines.idian. I could do some kind of search. Let's call him Draco Willink 2. And if I now uh, read that file, lines.eden, um, pipe it into relations. But then now I want to do from lines to files. Uh, Let's hope this works. No, this doesn't work. Uh, kind of uh, cut lines. Oh yeah, I, I didn't pipe. So I need to pipe. And now it's written those things back into the file system. Uh, it also did a few other things. Uh, yeah, it added some commas because I printed print the closure. But here we go. Here's the Jocko Willing 2. And if I make again now and preview uh, up here, then the article is called Jocko Willing 2, at least in the metadata. Is there uh, I think that was the things I had planned to show. This thing is large, uh, so I don't think it makes sense to read all of it <laughs> in front of you guys. Um, so this was as far that we had gotten. Are there other things you are interested in seeing? Just specific questions? That is wonderful. Yeah. Mark? Uh, is is there a literate uh, programming aspect to this, where the output of uh, running closure expressions can be shown within the document? Uh, so I'm I'm just using uh, built-in org mode things. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have a look. So I wrote uh, this article, essentially about how to use Pandoc from Closure. Uh, and let's page find, let's find the Pandoc article. Uh, and this thing is kind of large. Uh, but here, uh, there's some literate stuff. So here I just include the jet bb, uh, dot sh. Uh, and that's there. Uh, but that that's just Pandoc. So I, I haven't written any uh, literate programming things, but I, it's kind of, it feels like doing literate programming because I can just change things as they go and yeah, write programs to generate text files. Uh, I can show you uh, the index.clj. Uh, I added, <laughs> I was really happy with this message. We interrupt this page with the message from the visual tools meeting attendees. Uh, uh, so I could just add this because it's just a script. Uh, and here I just uh, here I just generate uh, some HTML inside org mode, uh, which is then converted to HTML again with Pandoc. <laughs> cool. So just some comments. Um, I'm a, a heavy Emacs user and uh, then org Rome came along uh, and I converted like a hundred of my uh, org files into Rome format. You know, I wanted all the backlinking and mm. uh, so that's been, um, marginally successful. I, I do find it a little bit cumbersome to try to maintain all the backlinks and Orgrom has some limitations. Um, but this this seems really uh, neat in the 
in its uh, ability to uh, facilitate collaboration. Uh, so uh, yeah, that it's 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 pretty exciting that you know you have this universal format based on on HTML. Everybody can participate and uh, using GitHub and so on, uh, standard tooling. So I think it'd be pretty cool, uh, you know, if if you were to sort of um, try to collaborate with a small group and maybe create a maybe a Wikipedia-like article, you know, with um, you know extensive use of linking, and um, you know, just try to work out what are the what are the aspects of your your tooling that uh, could be improved? What um, what works? What doesn't work as well? And uh, especially try to create some uh, cookbooks or uh, procedures for people to be able to participate. You know, so you know they they would need to uh, be able to use GitHub and probably um, some some tooling like Maggot or, or uh, similar, and especially, you know, how to create uh, the, the linking within documents to make a, uh, an interesting and usable collaborative doc. Hmm. So, um, yeah, if you could get just a handful of people together and say, we're gonna create an article about X and, uh, you know, guide everybody through contributing one uh, one section or a few paragraphs. Um, you'd have sort of a instance proof of of how your system would work in in a collaborative document development um, process. So looks that's very that's, promising. That's a really interesting idea. I, I had never thought about that. I, I just thought that like, everyone would have their own sites and then we would just link between the sites, but there could be collaboration within the sites, right? There, we, we could, yeah, like you say, build it, stuff it, together. It, exactly, right? I mean, um, true, you, you could do it between sites or within sites. Um, both would be, uh, I, I think, common use cases. Uh, some, you know, it depends on the granularity, right? Mm. Um, but um, it seems like it could also be something that would be useful in uh, the Cyclosh community. There's lots of documentation efforts. Um, so, yeah, really interesting stuff. Uh, I'm kind of trying to be like as. I'm not. I, I don't want to push this down somebody's throat right now. Sure. It's right. it's very much tailored to my exact preference, so I don't expect uh, other people to kind of love the same constraints. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that actually leads us uh, very neatly into uh, a section that I had written. Uh, but all this is heavily adapted for, for Theodore's preference. Uh, yeah. So I, I believe that a common toolkit should be extracted from personal preference. So play.to.eu is kind of my knowledge playground backyard garden thing. And I have this idea of extracting a toolkit uh, for knowledge for Babashka Zealots. <laughs> it's kind of the, the working title. Um, but it doesn't really exist yet. Right now, the only working system is the play.clj. I've tried writing a few things. Um, but I want to then, uh, for instance, not have a design constraint be that you have to use Emacs. Like we, we want to uh, allow everyone to, to contribute. Um, so if I can kind of uh, chop up this thing and uh, serve some utility and avoid uh, dependencies that we don't necessarily want to build in. I expect that we, we don't want to require that everybody use Emacs and org mode. Uh, I figure that VS Code, Calva, and Markdown should be equally uh, acceptable. 
I, I, <laughs> I have no experience writing color plugins, but <laughs> it's lucky that other people uh, people have. Um, and and I envisioned that we should try to pull information from multiple sites uh, that kind of follow the same interface, but perhaps interacting inside sites is equally valuable. I, I don't know yet. Um, yeah. So can, this, yeah. Then you can try both things. Uh, so uh, I didn't think of, of the um, pulling together aspect. So say you wanted to write a, uh, a tutorial or something and it had three chapters, you could assign a chapter uh, per contributor and then have some scripting that that assembles it into a final uh, document. Um, so that that kind of thing, I think, would be not a big leap from what you already have. Mm. I, I can comment here on uh, on the foreign reference part because uh, down here there's this remote references thing, and uh, to pick something I'm curious about. This is a book uh, by David Deutsch. And I kind of, I create these things as entities because then uh, when I want to do a page, find uh, the beginning of infinity and look at the metadata, then this thing just has a UUID. Then I can link to that from anywhere. Uh, and then the page is just a thing out. So then I can update the references in one place. Uh, and I think we could facilitate like inter, um, inter site collaboration in that some way, but it's kind of hard to speculate without running experience. Exactly. Yeah, the UUID is very helpful in, in that aspect. You won't have any uh, collisions in terms yeah. of, of the, uh, the artifacts. Uh, and that's if we hear, uh, I think I mentioned this. Yeah. So if we open this thing and do uh, text mode, then we see that this is actually just a UUID. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's where the uh, closure CLI comes in because I just put UIDs in the plain text and then I run the filter over the pandoc JSON that swaps out any ID colon uh UUID uh with the actual URL. Oh, cool. Uh, that's yeah. that's uh that's ingenious. It's kind of funny because that's that's really all you need to get that stable linking thing. Yeah, so back into uh org mode. Um, and Kyoto, it yep. would be good to start converging to a conclusion yep. uh, for, the, for this part. No rush, but uh, it yep. would be a good time. I uh, I agree. Uh, it's it's nice to open up, but it's also nice to actually cover the agenda. <laughs> um, yeah. So I would really like to see us create a knowledge archipelago for closure. And I believe that uh, with the community that we have, uh, it's possible. Um, there are current initiatives. Daniel and Kira are doing lots of important work. But perhaps we can activate more thinking phases. And some current initiatives. Uh, Kira has the data science cookbook. Uh, there's Clojupedia, which is kind of related. And there's uh, the uh, libraries page that Daniel uh, has made, which is also a fantastic resource. Yeah, uh, can be skipped. We're skipping this one. Yeah, and there's some contact info for me. So, I mean, you guys are able to find me, uh, but feel free to talk to me about this. This is something I. Uh, I find the collective knowledge management challenge to be a really interesting challenge, and I want us to apply it successfully uh, for for data science enclosure. 
there. Uh, thanks for the attention. Thank you so much, Theodore. It is really exciting because, you know, we, we, at least at the cyclos context, we have been, we have had challenges and, and we had these hopes you were talking about, but it, some of that never happened. And then you actually were researching lots of options and, and trying different tools and, and practicing different ways for a while since those early days of cyclosh and probably much earlier. And then seeing these fruits that we could actually start using, it was really an exciting moment. And then maybe after the kindly part that we'll have now, we could chat a little bit about how this could connect to the idea of namespace as a notebook, as we like to call it, where we actually use our closure namespaces as the source of truth. And yeah, um, I'll stop the recording for a moment. Hello, we are back from a short break. And now we'll talk about Kindly. And I will share my screen and uh, we will have a tiny demo and then discuss it. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, Kindly is currently a version three of a tiny thing we have been using for a while. And the idea is to actually start using it widely very soon. And one of the reasons is this coming uh, data science girls we're talking about and, and uh, many other needs uh, to write notes in a compatible way. And that is what we discuss in a moment. The idea is that kindly will be a certain way of expressing our nodes in closure namespaces and that it will hopefully be uh, usable from different tools. Currently, it is usable from this tool Clay, which I'm using now to render this page from a closure namespace that we have on the right. And uh, we are discussing it with a few of the tool makers. And it is also related to something which has been emerging in the last couple of weeks by Carsten Bering. Uh, this uh, case gammas is a fascinating project to create a certain standardized way to express notes and it is uh, similar and different in many ways and I think I'm very inspired by what Carsten has been doing and researching and I think we should discuss uh, how these things could be compatible and uh, th this current version of Kindly is really result of discussing um, it with a few of you and really very much inspired by, by conversations we've had in the past in this group. Let us just briefly mention the problem. We have many tools for writing notes, writing, visualizing things, they're doing this practice called literate programming. And we have many existing notes written in different ways. And each time somebody's writing some notes, uh, they actually need a certain way to express how things should be displayed. So for example, let us look into this uh, color tutorial by Tomash, which is written in Clerk, right? So here we can look inside and, uh, uh, sorry for my slow internet. Or, I'm sure. Oh yeah, so this beautiful color tutorial is written in Clerk and it needs a certain way to express that something is a color. And so in this case, it was defined by this function that Tomas written, which is adapted to Clerk so that Clerk would know how to show colors. So the notation here is eventually Clerk specific and the namespace which is generating this is Clerk specific. And maybe uh, to look into another example, maybe, uh, um, yeah, let us look into the beautiful tablecloth API docs, also by Tomash, right? This amazing page. This was written in Markdown, in actually in our Markdown 
and it has its way of saying how things should be displayed. And so each of these ways of writing notes has those little differences and things are not copy paste friendly as Carsten called it. And uh, maybe another example, uh, this VCLJ uh, tutorial by, uh, yeah, ne never mind. maybe uh, because of the slow internet, I skip a little bit. Uh, and in the past, in the psychology community, we have been using note space to write lots of notes. And the reason we stopped it and actually in a way kind of stopped uh, the progress with this note space tool is that it didn't have a clear path for being copy paste friendly and being able to use note space notes in the art tools which are emerging like Calva Notebooks and Portal and Clerk and all. And the goal is to have a way to make things copy paste friendly. So ideally what we want is that somebody writing a tutorial would be able to write it in a way that will have its own semantics of saying how, uh, what things should be displayed like, like this thing is a hiccup note, this is a Vega plot, but it would just work with existing tools and also with future tools, which do not exist at the moment of writing the tutorial. And now here is like a proposal of how we could do it. So conceptually, we want to have a certain notion called a kind, which is a keyword saying this thing is of kind, hiccup, for example. So for a given context, like a little piece of code that should be rendered and the value resulting from evaluating this code, for a given context, we could have some inference inferring what kind it is. And then the kind is the information that different tools could use to decide how to display it. So for example, all the tools we are talking about, they have a certain way of displaying hiccup uh, as HTML. So tools which are interested in, in using the advice of kind, kindly could see, oh, that is hiccup, then I will show it as hiccup. And the inference of kind could be done in a way which is specific to the user, specific to a, a given tutorial, because maybe in some tutorial, it would be convenient to write things in a certain way. But since kind inference is decoupled from actually implementing the kind, which is displaying hiccup, writing a given tutorial with a certain layer of kind inference should just work with different tools if they're interested in using kindly advice. So that's, that's the ideology. And of course, there is a challenge here and, and we'll see in a moment that some details are not obvious, but let us see how we could use it. So the idea is that uh, we uh, can uh, have, we can, the user can define certain functions which are called advice. So, and these functions, they have the logic of taking a given context and deciding what the relevant kind is. So for example, some user may wish to invent a special kind, or maybe let us use this imaginary kind that some, some tools could, could possibly uh, uh, wish to use. Sorry, I made a typo. Rendering. So possibly, let us imagine we have a certain kind called ABCD that some tools know how to render. So this user wants all the numbers in the notes to be rendered as this kind of thing, ABCD. And maybe they want all the, all the strings to be rendered as this kind, A, E, F, G, H. So they could define these advice functions that take a given context and if that context has a number value, for example, then it adds to the context, the relevant kind information. And this advice function would be used by all the relevant tools if the user configures the given namespace to use that advice. And then 
let us try these advices and see they're working. So we can ask for kindly advice for this context where the value is three with these advices we have defined. And then, yes, it does recognize that it has kind A, B, C, D, and, and so on. And the, the, the idea is that what the user would do in the namespace is something like that. They would set the advices to a given set of advices they're interested in. And then all tools, when the tools ask kindly for a given context, then that would just work. And all the tools will learn, oh, this thing is of kind A, B, C, D. And uh, in a moment, we'll see a few namespaces like that where the user defined a given set of advices, and then all tools would enjoy this kind inference. Here in this namespace, we were using actually the default uh, kind inference, which is something that, you know, behaves sensibly. So for example, here, some map was returned, so we could just see the map. So it didn't have any special kind. And, but let us go to another namespace. So um, here is like a, one example namespace where, you know, that could be a tutorial somebody's writing. So at the top of their namespace, they decided to have, you know, only this advice where all values, if the, the value was three, they would get this special kind ABCD. And otherwise, no, no kind information is added to the context. And then if we render, you know, if we look into this namespace, then, then we see, yeah, when we have this context of a value three, then uh, uh, the kind information would be added. So this call to kindly advice is not something the user would do. It is something the tool makers would do so that their tool would know how to render a given namespace. And in a moment, we'll discuss it further, but maybe uh, let us go to the uh, more detailed namespace where we see the default behavior of kindly. So here we only say default setup. So we get the default uh, behavior of kind inference. And then let us see what happens. So, so first, you know, when we take like uh, a given context, like value is some map, and we ask for kindly advice, then you see, it doesn't add any kind information because it, this simple map doesn't have any, any kinds to be inferred about it. It is just a map. But we could, by, by, by this default behavior, that we could specify the kind of things in certain ways. So for example, in this situation, we could say, yeah, let us take this value, but consider it as something of kind A, B, C, D. And then uh, you see, it does get the kind information. And there are, there are different ways to write it. And, and, and uh, I'm skipping a little bit, but the idea is that by this default behavior, it is possible to express the additional kind information for a given value or a given uh, form to be evaluated. So it would behave accordingly. And, and maybe let us see how things look this way. So for example, I created some hiccup data structure by saying the word hello in purple color. So if I just write my hiccup, my hiccup then there is no special kind information and it is just rendered as a data structure. Right? And uh, but if I consider it as kind of hiccup, then I would see it actually rendered as a purple hello. And there are different ways to write it uh, by uh, you know calling this special kind function and also by attaching metadata to the code. Uh, and so by this default behavior of kindly, all these ways would work. And we see here the clay tool rendering this page and showing the purple hello. And hopefully any other tool 
that would like to use Kindly's advice would just need to pass the relevant information to Kindly and then realize, oh, that should be considered as hiccup and then display a purple hello. And um, yeah, and uh, some kinds are, are uh, inferred by default. So for example, if we have a var, then it would get the kind var. And that is maybe interesting because uh, Theodore, you had some ideas about how a closure var could be rendered in a beautiful way with including documentation and such. And if you have like an image, for example, then it does get the kind of a buffered image. And here you see the clay tool also use this image already as, as the image instead of you know, any other way because that because the clay tool asks for kindly's advice and it says oh that value is an image so I would show it as an image. Right? So that is a little taste of, of how things look in the clay tool. And uh, the idea is to to allow all tools to actually behave this way. So ideally, this namespace could be viewed in Clerk, for example, by writing a small adapter where we use, in the case of Clerk, we use those predicates uh, that Clerk has for viewers. And those predicates would just call kindly and, and pass the value and get the relevant result. And any comments so far? Is it, is it actually confusing what I'm saying? Maybe it is confusing. So you see, maybe I'll just comment. You see here, we, we see how a typical tutorial looks. So we are not having explicit calls to advice on the user side. The call for advice is something the tool would do. So Clay, the tool used here, was calling the kindly advice to realize that this thing was of kind hiccup, right? And yeah, just to clarify, sorry. I, I have a question, but I, I'm kind of guessing that it's a big one. So you can choose either to answer yeah. or, or just wait. Uh, is kindly a protocol? No, uh, but there is, a, it, it is extensible by protocols as one of the ways to extend it. Uh, I mean protocol, not in the closure protocol sense, but in the uh, like uh, IP and stuff, it, it, because it kind of sounds like we're trying to define sort of a narrow waste between providers and showers. Things. Oh yeah, yeah. Actually, then yes, it is. Then yes, it is. It is a stateful protocol because you see, we can do some some. Uh, mutation of the, how it is configured to behave. But after that, after we, for example, set up the defaults, then it is a certain function that could be formalized that tools could use to, so the, the device of kindly is, uh, could be considered a protocol, yes. Mm. So that is something a tool would call to realize, oh, this value, it actually doesn't have any kind information. So I would just render it my different ways. Uh, but the only uh, function that a tool would actually call would be the kindly advice function, right? Every yes. The setting uh, in between that you had like on most of those things where it's like, well, please consider this as hiccup wouldn't be something that the tool would do. That would be something in your namespace, right? Right, only exactly. basically this kindly advice would be the only function that's ever called by, well, I mean, maybe there's in the future some, but like right now the only function that would be used by the tools would be the kindly advice thing. And all the rest would be like stuff that you use to have different kind outcomes basically, right? Yeah, all the rest is on the user side, mm -hmm. like setting up the, the uh, the behavior, adding advice, actually specifying that a certain value has a certain kind, all that is happening on the user side. On the tool side, we only call kindly advice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that you. makes sense. Otherwise, we'd have problems with the stateful stuff if we transfer in between different JVMs or different runtimes, right? 
uh, if you're displaying stuff runs in CLJS or whatever, you could you wouldn't be able to set uh, certain things the way that you set the defaults right now, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now maybe let us talk about two problems, if if that is making sense uh, for now. Yeah. So one problem is that not always the value is enough for the context because sometimes, and that is controversial actually, we are not sure about this detail and, and uh, there is a long conversation with it, with Carsten about it and, and in the last few days. So some users were asking for this kind of notation saying, yeah, this thing, I, I wish to attach this little piece of metadata to the code to say this thing should be rendered as hiccup, right? And, and that is something that Clerk does as well. And it is not obvious because to make that work, the tools would also need to pass additional information to the advice function. They would need to pass not only the, the resulting value, but also the form which was which was um, evaluated so we see it here for example so that is how kindly behaves at the moment if we pass a given form like this one plus two with additional metadata then kindly would be able to realize oh yeah that is of kind abcd so you see the metadata was part of the code but it is not metadata of the resulting value. And these situations, they, they are kind of necessary, I think, because some users like this habit. And also it has this advantage that when we attach metadata this way, then the resulting value is not touched by metadata. And in some situations, it is desirable that it is only used as a, a certain annotation for how things should be rendered and not change actually the resulting values. And so that is one controversial detail. Should we actually support that? And would actually the tools the, or the tool makers like the idea of having to pass also the form and not only the value? Another trouble is the JVM. So some situations need the actual JVM to infer the kind. So for example, here, we recognize this Java type Java class and realize, oh, that should be viewed as an image. So for example, if I understand correctly, Calva notebooks pass the value to the JavaScript runtime, and then it is decided how to display things. So even though kindly is CLJC, that would be too late because the information of the Java class is currently not passed to the JavaScript side in, uh, in uh, Calva notebooks. So this dependency on the JVM is something to consider how we could support that. And concretely, you know, if we have a buffered image, which is something that we sometimes have, how would we, we like to infer that it should be viewed as an image? And so you see, we have those dilemmas and that is something that, you know, I am really hoping to discuss with you, uh, Lucas. And, but for now, that is the concept. And, um, and the hope is to converge to something that kind of works, do all the necessary compromises and be able to start using it and actually write notes which are copy-based friendly. In the beginning, we'll only use this clay tool, which is just a tiny tool to support that. And gradually we will hope to make adapters for different tools. So Clerk should be easy because it has this predicate uh, uh, way of defining, of inferring viewers, but it would not support the form, uh, passing the form metadata at the moment. So there is a trouble there and other tools may have other challenges, but uh, that is the current situation. Yeah, is it making sense actually? Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for understanding the situation.
and and you see uh, we are in this moment that where compromises are needed and possibly we should make things mm -hmm. sim simpler and more stupid till they actually work <laughs> yeah that's what i was going to ask this is really cool um i was just going to ask about i guess what you just mentioned was like how what you think it'll take to integrate this with um the different like viewers or notebooks or whatever so like clerk the calva notebooks maybe portal um so yeah it sounds like I, I can see what you're saying it makes sense that you could implement this for clerk by basically just writing like a set of custom viewers and that should be like pretty straightforward that's pretty cool but then i guess the hiccup with no, no pun intended uh the problem with like uh calva would be the jvm because right is is there any way to like would does it I, is there any way for calva plug or a, a vs code plugin to get access to a jvm runtime well calva itself does have it right because you're connected mm -hmm. to the REPL. um but i think on that side the easiest way would be to actually run the thing with the kindly around it uh, with the get advice thing around it because that would be run in the REPL, right and then we would get the whole expression with its kind back from the REPL, and that would be basically thrown right into portal and then you're done um which is pretty nice because then we basically don't have to do anything on calma's side anymore um cool. and one of the fun things around Calva's, uh, like Calva's notebooks and portal is that it's the same thing, kind of. Um, mm. The basic display is just Eden or like Markdown, I think, and like a two or three more, but I didn't want to spend any extra time on creating visualizations or views or whatever, sure. because it's so much easier to just display it in portal, right? And now right. if we get kindly integration into portal, we magically have it in uh, Calva notebooks as well. That's really cool. OK. Nice. And yeah, yeah. as you said, the uh, difficulty is kind of getting the kindly function to run in the same JVM. Right. Um, but I think that can happen if you just like put the kindly call with it as to be executed in the JVM where like the rest of the call is executed anyway um we can probably have like a special wrapper that like does that for you and you don't have to write the kindly thing around it right and then i don't know put some like metadata on the ns or whatever and say well this ns always gets around every call this kindly call uh, which hopefully doesn't explode usually <laughs> um but and then, uh, then you're done that's really cool and then yeah would this be like are you picturing trying to work with all of the tool maintainers to integrate kindly support, but then it would kind of be like an optional, like um, not an improvement. What am I trying to say? An optional, like other way of using the tool. So basically like a tool could, you could support kindly for, with clerk, for example, and like not use it at all. And clerk would still just work like normal, but then like, is that the goal to have it eventually merged into like the main tool so that like you could say yeah you can copy paste this uh notebook text from your from calva to clerk to portal and it'll all it'll render in all of them or you can just write the standard clerk way and that will also work like is that am i is that like the vision or whatever yes yeah, yeah. okay yeah i think you for clarifying that yeah so for example with clerk let us say we have a kindly compatible notebook yeah yeah then somebody might be interested in using that with clerk so right. they may need to call one function to uh, adapt clerk to kindly because maybe clerk doesn't support it by default so that right. one call of function would just uh, define those viewer predicates that right. clerk needs and then it would just work. That's it so would cool. just work for all values that have kind information. And right. Other values that don't have kind information would just have the usual clerk behavior. 
So that's, that's cool though, because then I see what you're saying now. I, I think I get it better now. Like, yeah, kindly, like you could include kindly in your project and then call this like set up, you know, set up kindly advices or whatever. And then, yeah. And then for the rest of the notebook, it would just know how to render stuff. That's really cool. Cause then I'm just thinking of like, that's just easier. Cause then like, yeah, that can be implemented. That can be like a community effort and there's no need to actually get like, obviously it would be ideal to get buy-in from Martin or whatever, but if it's, it can be like a totally optional add-on, it doesn't have to be merged into the main actual thing. Same for, and same for portal or whatever. Although it sounds like portal and VS code are totally on board. So yeah, that's cool. I really like this. I think this is super cool. Thank you. Yeah, and then for Portal, Portal has this submit function where you can pass a value. And say, uh, typically, uh, you bind that to the closure tab so that all everything which is tapped goes to submit. Right? So we could just add a submit function that figures out the, the advice before actually submitting. So it could be a uh, you know, uh, variation of the portal submit function. And so for different tools, it might look just a bit different uh, how things should be done. And, but for that, we have time. What we need, I think, is to, to converge something that does make the necessary compromises and then just start writing notes already. And then the other tools will eventually, hopefully, converge to being able to view those notes. But you know that is also needed for for motivating the need for adapters. Actually, having notes which could be usable yeah. in those tools. So that's the plan to spend some time asking for for feedback from tool makers, and then converge to the necessary compromises and focus on writing notes. Actually. And right and then actually start doing <laughs> work and notes and whatever instead of talking about talking about talking about notes yeah but yeah but this is the software developer way you know you spend your whole life just writing tools and never do any actual work um dumb question daniel um like does the kindly advice function can I just throw anything in there and it would basically run the normal thing? Could, so I'm thinking about like the Calva namespaces. If I just wrapped every single cell magically with the kindly advice, even like defens and defs and whatever, cause like, I don't, I mean, I could make distinctions, but I would be wrong at some point, right? Because somebody would have their own defen macro written and that would explode. So, could I just like put it around everything without having any problems? Yes, yes. You pass a map to the advice and you get a map where the, the map you get would possibly have an additional kind field and possibly it could change the value. So sometimes it is actually useful to get one value as input, and then kindly would the kindly advice would say, "Oh, actually, you want to display that other value, which is a better representation, a better visual representation." Mm -hmm. So possibly, oh, actually, is that problematic, right? Should we avoid that? Possibly, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we should think, right? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Maybe think. have it in a maybe have it in a different uh, field in the map, right? having like value always be the value that you actually passed. So it stays the same and having like display value or whatever is the extra thing uh, that might be understood by the tool or might not be. Uh, but at least your thing doesn't change anymore. It just the biggest thing that can happen to you is that you now have like extra keys in your map, which usually doesn't destroy anybody in the closure name, closure community, right? Usually we don't care about extra stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. But what happens yeah. if I don't give it a map? Like if it, as, as I said, if I say like kindly advice and then put def something in there. And then it def would something, work. would it yeah. explode? Uh, 
Because that would be like the important thing for it to just then, well, I mean, I don't care what it gives me back because I mean, there's no real interesting thing that a dev can display anyway. I mean, it would be just be the var, right? But vars usually don't have any interesting thing to display. But the important thing is that like, I can wrap every single cell magically in that. And it's still at least that's the thing that should happen. Interesting. So that is not how it works at the moment. At the moment, it is expecting a map where there is a, at least a value member in the oh, mm -hmm. field in the map. And that the value would be the value. Mm. Right? And, but yeah, I'm not sure. Should we change it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. we could yeah. also like have a second function, right? That mm. is safe to just pass anything in, right? And that could do the thing and underneath it's calling like if it gets in a map it's gonna kindly advise otherwise it's just executing the thing and doing nothing kind of uh, like my point is just i need something that i can always do right because calva itself doesn't want to like do interpretation on like your forms and whatever because it's gonna get wrong sometimes yeah that makes sense thank you yeah and uh, I see the clock, maybe some people may need to leave. And uh, Lucas, I'm tempted to ask you more about Calva notebooks. And so, but maybe uh, we could stop for a moment and for those who may need to say goodbye, say goodbye. And if somebody wishes to say some concluding words, it is a good time. And then those who could stay could chat a little more. Um, uh, yeah, So. so, yeah, I need to go. So yeah, good thank you, you so much, Mark. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see you later. All right. Take care. Yeah, take care. Thank Very you. Right. Yeah, so we're still recording. I think it makes sense for those who could stay. And then yeah, Lucas, what do you think about this idea of passing not only the value, but also the form which was evaluated? Right? Mm -hmm. That is one of the controversies here. And, and the reason is that, yeah, some tools may not find it comfortable to pass this additional information. Mm -hmm. And it is kind of a user need. And yeah, anyway. My, I mean, in my case, it would be easier, right? Because like I would only pass the form, mm -hmm. uh, right? Because mm -hmm. I would just take the thing, wrap it in kindly whatever. I don't care. You can mm -hmm. like provide me an extra function that I can wrap with it. And I would throw that into the repo and expect the inner thing to run like normal and get some kind of value back that you want then displayed. Um, yeah. And I wouldn't do this always because like not everybody is gonna use currently and whatever, but we can just have one more metadata thing on the namespace, right? And then Calva, that's easy to read. Like I'm hoping I'm not gonna make a mistake when reading like a little metadata thing on the namespace. Mm -hmm. And if the namespace is like a kindly namespace or something, I'm gonna wrap every single thing in this kindly call uh, before mm -hmm. executing. And if it's not well, then like I don't need to do it. And we're gonna have like some weirdness around some tooling, right? Uh, like something like tracing is gonna expect, like it's gonna see the thing and tell you, well, you traced into this thing and you're gonna see the cell and it's not gonna have the kindly thing because we don't wanna show that it's also gonna get called. So there's gonna be some weirdness, but I don't think it's gonna be like major and probably it's gonna be easy to explain why more happened than as was actually written there, right? So yeah. No, I think for us, it makes total sense to throw in the whole form. Plus, like you said, uh, the, the whole form would be because of metadata, right? And we're already doing the metadata craziness anyway, because Portal is using metadata to say which kind of viewer you want to use. So uh, we're already in that minefield. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, then Lucas, I I will ask you more about it in the coming days, I'm hoping. And thank you for your patience. I know uh, you have been kind of open to talk about it for a while and I I was very slow with kind of 
Yeah. It's all good. Like I've been busy as well. So uh... yeah, I imagine. Yeah, as always. Yeah. Mm. Um. Mm, yeah. Uh, maybe in a moment we should stop the recording unless there's more. Uh, yeah. I, I just have a question to the kindly API interface. Uh, when you register advice, is that kind of global immutable? Yeah, there is an atom, which is the list of advices, and the user can change this atom to make to be any list of things that should happen. Mm. Because when, when reading your notebook, I would kind of expect that I would I should be able to see that in a notebook, and if we make that mutable per namespace rather than mutable globally, then the user would have to put it in their own namespace and they could just like def it in somewhere else and then reuse it if they want to. But I guess that would require you storing that data differently. That is clever. So possibly we could have both and then encourage the practice of, of making it namespace specific, but at least have the default behavior otherwise globally right yeah it could all make sense I, I mean either you could kind of provide multiple viewers and then you just uh read uh the viewers nearest the user first and pick one of those and then fall back to generals or yeah yeah it also makes a difference what you want to use the whole thing for right because for a tutorial, I want to like define all the kindly stuff at the beginning. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. But if I've got like a huge project that like I'm using only for myself or where I'm distributing the whole project and not just a namespace, I can have like one namespace that gets loaded and has all the kindly craziness in it and everything else doesn't need to know about it. Hmm. Right. Now, here is the beautiful thing we could keep evolving that part we don't need to decide now because the tool only asks for kindly advice without specific details of what advice the users can keep evolving how they specify the advices any given notebook will have its own version of kindly oh no actually there is a trouble of versioning because the tool might depend on, yeah, it actually might break. Yeah, so we should be careful, <laughs> but yeah, we should be careful. But possibly, possibly if we figure out the versioning problem, maybe dividing it into two libraries or something, we could keep all versions of kindly working, like an old default or an old way to specify advice and, and, and allow it to keep evolving. But that does, requires separating to two different libraries, right? And that's the idea. We want an old notebook to keep working, even if it used an old version of Kindly's defaults. That is actually needed, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah sure. but I mean, like the newest version could always just translate from like old Kindly's to new Kindly's, right? If it like your old thing could use Kindly uh, old, hiccup or whatever and you've got the new thing running right now the new thing could still understand what old dash hiccup is and like produce the new one right or just produce both of them or whatever and think we should be careful because like at some point you're going to overwrite every possible useful keyword uh, <laughs> but are you talking about but, like the kindly library itself changing the way it annotates certain types of viewers are you talking about like changes in the underlying no, I'm, yeah, okay. the, the kindly library itself, like, oh, yeah, having like... different kinds of kinds. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know if those are actually useful to change, but uh, anytime you think, well, this is not going to change, it's kind it'll, of... Yeah, that's, the thing. that's yeah. a good way to think. It'll, it will always will change. <laughs> We're yeah. going to define yeah, number as being something, and then next week we're going to be like, no, numbers are actually something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's smart. Yeah, like if it's internal, at least, like if it's all done under the hood, really, then yeah, you could kind of obscure those implementation details from the, the end user, probably, assuming like it's still compatible with the. I think one thing that was like, how 
to keep it to keep kindly compatible with like all past versions of the notebooks i think will be another challenge or maybe maybe similar but i think it's again it's possible if like i don't know i don't know if every made every combination of kindly and every notebook could work but that would be cool i think I guess... the notebooks itself wouldn't be too problematic the more problematic thing would be like different versions of the tools that show it right right um, if they all of a sudden say well my hiccup right. now is different than it was like two years ago um and it's just gonna have like a different display right and you're expecting notebooks usually to stay the same over versions like exactly the same not like kind right. of the same and that would kind of break right but i don't think there's any way to fix it anyway unless you hard code the output Right. Yeah. Yeah. So here is where we should be clever and we'll keep thinking about it and, and maybe, yeah, and I'll keep asking you about it. Um, any comments before? breaking the first few versions. I mean, like, that's why the first few versions are betas, right? Or alphas or whatever we want to call them. It's actually a good thing to break the first few versions, I feel like, usually, because then you notice that you actually learn something new and like have better behavior for the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is important. Yeah. I mean, that's why you're on B3 now of Kindly, right? Right. <laughs> Breaking the first two. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. And it should, by just by this principle, it should remain alpha while we start writing notes for a while. And, and yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, should we maybe stop the recording in a moment and those who can stay can stay further? Yeah, so mm -hmm. anybody, any concluding comment about you know what you were presenting? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So goodbye to our listeners and see you on the next time.